Thank you for joining this evening for Basic Buddhist Teachings. And for those of you that have been joining the last few weeks, I've been talking about the six paramitas. So we've covered the first paramita of generosity, discipline, and patience. And tonight we're going to talk about exertion. In Sanskrit, this is virya, or Tibetan sandru. And that's all I know about it. So Kazan, for those of you that joined um, as it is, actually had a few questions about exertion, which was helpful. It was a little like cheat code from the teacher. Because the way Sokazan talks about exertion is, is a, a little bit different, at least in the way it's presented, than the way Trungpa Rinpoche presents it. Trungpa presents it in a very classical form, um, with exertion being kind of like a antidote to laziness. Exertion and laziness. And Sokazan talks more about, um, as he did not as it is, just receiving is exertion, or stillness is receiving. And while he didn't say this tonight, um, when he calls and asks us to hold our seat, that is a phrase, that is a teaching that I have returned to regularly throughout my time here is to hold your seat. And it's important in, in when we acknowledge this, that it's not necessarily something we accomplish and nor is it um, something we do out of exertion in the form of aggression. We don't, we don't just hold our seat because we're biting our tongues, although sometimes we're probably doing that. But something Trumpa said that um, I really appreciated, that when he was talking about exertion, he talked a lot about having some sort of joy. And similar to when we talk about humor, it's not necessarily funny. And joy doesn't necessarily mean exuberance or smiling but he called it the appreciation of virtue rather than just working hard and appreciation is a term that Sokozan has used regularly for many years and that so our exertion is not just some idea that we're just working hard we're going to bite the bullet we're going to grind into this but the appreciation really comes from reflecting on the opportunity we have through the path that while no, the path is not easy, where else are we going to be able to hear something like these teachings? Where are we given an opportunity to see what we are experiencing in a radical sense, as opposed to encouraged to pacify or cover up until we've weathered the storm? To actually cultivate a deep understanding of what it means to be embodied. And so in that sense, the idea of appreciation resonates pretty strongly, that our exertion on the path isn't necessarily out of aggression or maintenance, which we can't, we can't maintain. Our path is based on aggression, we'll tire ourselves out. But if there's some appreciation for the preciousness of what we're working with, the precious opportunity we have to be in a community where simultaneously, um, the trigger we receive is also the, the introduction or the invitation onto the path. And so as with all the paramitas, because they're paramitas, perfections, they, they can't be prescribed as activities. It's not like I can give you a checklist and say, if you do these six things, you know this is the paramita of exertion. With all of them, we feel a little bit lost when we actually begin to look at transcendental generosity, transcendental discipline, transcendental patience, transcendental exertion. But it helps create attention to look deeper at our assumptions around this. Even the idea of appreciation, it doesn't necessarily mean enjoyment, like to appreciate a piece of art. For most of us non-art folks, it means you have to like the art to appreciate it. But when we practice something like opening the eye mind, we recognize it doesn't really matter how we feel about the piece of art for us to be able to appreciate the composition itself. And so to appreciate, you could say, the composition of our life. 
the contrast, the forms, the shapes, the sounds that arise moment by moment does not necessarily mean that we have to enjoy them. So we come back to this idea of what Sokozan was saying of stillness, of receiving, of appreciating that our exertion is not a demand we have on ourselves, but of profound appreciation for the opportunity that presents itself to us moment by moment. And I have to say that of the six paramitas, certainly for me, the hardest one to talk about. Anger is the most resonant. So last week, talking about uh, patience and anger, it's like my I could make my practice there the rest of my life. Exertion is harder. It's particularly difficult because we don't really push each other in that way. We're not making demands of activity. And also, I resonate with Sokozan when he always says that he's very lazy. I think that's one of the things Sokozan have, I have in common, really like to sit and just watch a TV show or listen to some music. So I appreciate that in the context of here, we're not making the demand that our exertion is dependent on constant grinding activity, but a willingness to be aware of our lives and the emotions as they arise moment by moment. Questions about the paramita of exertion or appreciation? Undo. What is the difference between uh, your definition of exertion and returning? Um, I think you could probably use returning in the context of exertion. If Sokozan talks about receiving or stillness, those are not things we maintain, but they are things we return to. So the idea of receiving is not maintained indefinitely, but we return to an intention to receive. We don't maintain stillness, but we return to stillness in a, a literal physical sense in meditation and maybe in a more abstract sense in the intention to be with the movement. So to me, um, returning very much would align with the paramita of exertion. It seems like there's a energy behind exertion uh, and I don't know if it's the same thing as intention is that is it the is, is it the our intention what returns us or helps us exert Intention is the path quality of exertion. And what I sometimes like to remind myself of is we are talking about paramitas. We're not talking about something that you just pick up these six and then you just practice and do them. We're talking about uh, you know, some level of a bodhisattva being able to manifest these spontaneously and effortlessly. So true exertion does not require any energy in a classical sense that the uh, energy to turn the wheel of the Dharma, that's the classical way of saying teaching, while it may take physical energy, there is no particular resistance that actually has any validity. So there's a type of energy that uh, we see on a daily basis with Sokazan. We also see somewhat within the Sangha, this people just show up and you're not really sure why. So um, the paramita of exertion in its most classical sense is not something we, we can just see, nor is it something we cultivate and have this secret energy. It'd be like a bottomless well, It'd be like infinite. There'd be no, you're never going to run out of that type of energy. So if we're talking about energy that you might run out of, it's not quite the paramita of exertion, although it may very much be the practice or the path quality of working with exertion. Shodo. Shodo Valley. Why is it that just working hard um, isn't the same thing as exertion? Bowing? Well, it depends on how you're talking about it. That in a, if we're talking about just work hard and get ahead, it still has that mentality of 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 utilizing, of acquiring, of of going beyond, getting rid of something. 
And so it's really based on some sort of fruition or some sort of result or some sort of product. And that the paramitas are not really pointing at that as I understand it, that this is very much tied into the spiritual path, the path of the bodhisattva. And again, it's not to say that you wouldn't work hard at something that the path of meditation is, is hard work. I think it does take a certain amount of energy or you could say determination or insistence on seeing this through. So there is relative times where that waxes and wanes. But I do think it contrasts from the paramita of exertion in the sense of um, that inspiration to, to live for the benefit of all beings without exception. Shadow bowing. Um, I feel like Sopazan spoken of any of the paramitas as they're they're already the case or something like that. So I wonder how do we how do we cover up that exertion that's already the case? Bowing. It it probably shows up in myriad ways. I think a lot of the ways in which it shows up is when we reject what is occurring and exert our own will on the situation. We actually think that we have a type of insight that takes precedent over what is arising. But when we begin to discriminate or differentiate or work in a way that requires us to work against the situation as it shows up. Hands on, so, yeah, go ahead. Ken Zambowing, it's it's relatively easy to imagine exertion when ego is claiming some some territory in order to push against, you know, some ground to push against to exert. What is exertion that that is not necessarily feeding that tendency of the mind to claim territory for itself? Bowing. I don't know how helpful this would be, but. I would say the vow. Um, the ego can try to usurp the vow, but when the actuality of having to be with our life and our world and our thoughts and the people around us shows up, um, it's not nearly as pleasant as we had hoped it would be. And so I think that's our aspiration, our intention to work with the vow, to work with this idea of, of receiving receiving everything that arises in consciousness, receiving everything that arises in our world. So, Corinne? So, Corinne Bowie, uh, excuse this question, if it's incorrect, but is is there a, is it virya or energy on the Eightfold Noble Path? Is it, it one of the, one of them, really? Uh, it, to be honest, you would know better than me. <laughs> I'm not sure, is it? I don't remember. I've not, I've studied, as we've talked about, there's some concepts that really stick. For me, when Sokozan started about talking about the eight consciousnesses, I was completely enamored with it. And the Eightfold Path is not one that I've, been able to remember i really stick with the shila samadhi prajna you know, the discipline meditation and wisdom <clears throat> and i just don't recall if virya is in there so current value uh can can enter can virya be misguided can can we be rowing or working with a direction that may not be fruit fruit I think that relatively we can, but I don't think that would be virya. I mean, you might want to call it energy or exertion or sandru, but I don't think that that would be what's being pointed at. I think that, again, in its most relative sense that, yes, sometimes we find ways to just dig our trenches. We, we would much rather live in a hole. And so we just spend a lot of energy reifying our, our thoughts, our beliefs, our ideas. Um, I often go to, I think it wasn't a waste of time at all, but the, the several years I spent practicing before moving here, it was very much about strategizing and accumulating teachings that 
had a nice sound idealistically that I could kind of repeat, but I was unwilling to work with any of them that challenged me, that actually put me back into my own negativity. So I spent a lot of energy practicing, but my intention was very much about pacifying my own emotions. I don't think it was a waste of time. I think it prepared me. I don't know if I could have began studying with Sokazan right away. But I don't think had I continued with that, it would have been the same as being redirected back into my own negativity as this path seems to do. You Dao? You Dao Bowing. I was just looking at the Eightfold Path and matching it up with Sheila Samadhi and Prajna for some project. But I think it's right effort. Is that the same as exertion? And maybe Sokar and his approval. Um, I... <laughs> What I think I get stuck on is that these words are so contrary to the way that I feel supported on the path, and they're completely valid. There are people that the right effort, the type of exertion that's being talked about in the classical sense is going to support them. I feel that it's just very easy for me to grasp onto those ideas of how to do that, what it means as far as prescribed activity. And I bring that up a lot. I know I say that phrase a lot, but it's because we are so desperate for a reference point that even in spirituality, we, we are demanding someone to just tell us what to do. And then we don't have to think about it and we just do it. And that is you know, the ideal spiritual path. It should just be a child for the rest of our lives to have some power telling us, now do this, now do that. And so right effort to me could go along with right intention that you know an intention is much more in line with not maintaining intention doesn't really feel as aggressive um, I, I realize there's a lot of subjectivity in this but the intention is very much about intending one's life to be in service to others but not demanding a result to come from that whereas oftentimes with effort we're expecting some form of result some sort of re reward for the effort we exert you don't mind. I, I guess the secondary question is if you have the intention, then is the effort or exertion, does that come more easily then? Um, I don't think so necessarily, because when we start to orient our lives in the direction of service to others, it seems like we're challenged more. That it, because we have to see through our idealism around that sort of vow which does sound very good on paper and when confronted with the actuality of the suffering of our own minds in the context of the suffering of the world i find that it might become even harder and to come back to me the two foundational aspects of my practice would be um, meditation and how that is um brought to life through the lineage and the teacher. So if the energy comes from anywhere, it's not necessarily I can see that, but it's almost like it's infused. There's a sort of inertia that comes through the lineage. There's a sort of inertia that comes through the teacher that we can't really quite say what it is, but it, it pushes us a little bit. It gives us that kind of encouragement that you can do this, that we can do this. So that's nice in that we don't have to find some artificial energy within ourselves or try to maintain energy. We can actually utilize these forms and this tradition and this history and this lineage to help remind us that we can do this when we don't feel like we can do it. Um, it's difficult territory to begin to soften. And Mundabai, uh, are you pointing to the paramitas and like exertion that we talked about tonight as original time? I think it's good to keep that in context so that we don't just assume it is an accomplished, like generosity is the easiest one for me to talk about because there's a lot of relative forms of generosity that are very apparent and obvious. And it's easy to think that if we just act generously, then we have the paramita of generosity. When in actuality, I think what is being pointed at is a type of 
of abundance or wealth that has nothing to do with our ability to transact. In the Bodhicharya Vatara, the Bodhisattva, the path of the Bodhisattva, it talks about offerings. I think there's an entire section on offering and it it just talks about mentally offering everything. Like you don't even have to have something physically, but you actually mentally offer all of your possessions, all of your health, all of your well-being, all of your merit. And so I don't know that we have to um, be consumed one way or another, but to just remind ourselves that these paramitas are not just the simple ways in which we might define discipline or generosity or patience or exertion or meditation or wisdom. All six of those are endeavoring to point to something that is beyond the grasp of the intellect. It's beyond the grasp of just a, a concepts. But we can start with concepts, we can study concepts, we can see the ways in which we feel stingy, or we feel lazy, or we feel aggressive. What about uh, to study the param paramita of exertion? Could we look at our teacher and, and look to see if we see exertion? You can, but that's a projection. But yes, you can. Like it's not, it's not like, oh, it's a projection, don't look but very much so you can look at that because I've even told stories about the one I often come back to is riding back from prisons with Soka Zanununyo. And um, I've always been a pretty annoying student, I think. I was always asking questions. And, and when I would stop asking questions, Soka Zanun would fall asleep about five seconds later. And then I'd have another question. And he'd, he'd be right there. I mean, there's no if Rumi asks me a question at 6 a.m., I'm just annoyed and just uh, not going to answer. But there was no resistance or hesitation to respond to those questions. But that's still a projection. It's not like I have the insight or we have the insight to say, oh, I can see that. But we can draw inspiration. Sanho. Sanho Bowen. Is there a relationship between exertion and Trungpa's ruthlessness? Sanhavan. I'm sure I could make up a story that would uh, connect those two. When we look at the paramitas at a, as a whole, they don't really parse out individually. It's, it's talked about that they all arise simultaneously. And so that every gesture of body, speech, and mind is a manifestation of the six paramitas, all six of them at once. And you could say that the, the activity of a teacher towards their students are all gestures of the six paramitas. I've been, we talked to Sokodan about this a bit, I've been reading about three of Trungpa Rinpoche's teachers and it really helps me to see what, how he received his own education. And I, from the sounds of it, Trungpa was quite sweet um, in the context of some of these other teachers that he studied with. Yes. So I'm thinking about the way he uses ruthlessness to mean something like, just keep going, um, he uses that word quite a bit. My understanding of it would be like always be willing to examine your mind. Um, is that how you were using it as well, Sonhuba? I think I, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. The ruthlessness actually to me shows up in our own minds that the the teacher um again the whole idea of crazy wisdom it's only crazy because it looks crazy in the context of conventional consensus but the teacher does whatever is necessary to help point out that fixation so the actual tension the actual warfare the actual ruthlessness really only occurs in one's own mind and it's just very sensitive it's very tender when the teacher points that out Um, in that example with 
seeing the exertion in the teacher and acknowledging that that's a projection? Is there something like with a mere quality or, or something we can see about ourselves? Um, it, is there a way to take that and like examine exertion in ourselves that we're like projecting out? Um, that's clear. I think that we can acknowledge that. We can acknowledge even conceptually the way in which we imprint our own preferences, our own standards, our own ideas and beliefs onto the world. And that's what we receive. It's not just with the teacher, but it's with our Dharma brothers and sisters and with the news and with politics and with the weather and with the environment that we're pretty heavily laminated in our own prejudice in those situations. But we don't want to get to the point where we just have some sort of disdain because then we're, again, we're, we're looking away from the very thing we need to look at. So coming back to Sokazan's word of stillness, that's an area we can return to that does not require a reference point to, aside from the body, intention to be still. That's where we return to. Um, is there anything genuine or honest about our projections? Well, I think they're completely sincere coming out of our confusion. <laughs> I, I don't think there's anything particularly malicious about them intentionally. So they're, they're, they're sincere in as far as the causes and conditions that are arising are arising. We don't need to modify those. But it probably is a good idea to try to see them for what they are, which is uh, without self-nature, one way of talking about it, or to see that they are impermanent or that they see that they are not what we are putting them onto. Our ideas are not the actuality of what we're looking at. I don't know. That's the area I'm really curious about, where are we actually seeing something that is exertion, but we're erroneously placing it on someone? It's getting, and I, it's my own shortcoming, it's getting very complicated. You're, you are not going to be able to delineate this. So if you're delineating it in a way that makes sense to you, I, I wouldn't take that away from you. But I think it's getting very complicated in, in a sense of the, the simplicity is you don't have to understand what it is conceptually to see what it is deeply. And so that means whatever showing up that you are trying to resolve, you don't actually have to resolve it. It can just look confusing. It can look like a truth or it can look like a projection. And that if our intention is to receive those, those movements in consciousness, the, the content that feels very seductive, that, that's inviting us to play with it, that it's inviting us to figure out our lives with, does not need our attention, doesn't need our maintenance, it doesn't need our engagement. The practice of shikantaza is not defined by what we do with the thoughts that arise. It is just the willingness to be with or to receive or to observe. And those thoughts have, you could say, the sovereignty to do whatever they need to do. We just return to this idea of, of watching it. And a few more minutes if there's further questions this evening. Yu Hong Baoying. Yes, Yu Hong. I have two questions. The first question is how can we how can we encourage ourselves to see we already have enough to sit? The reason I ask is when I when I was on the retreat, I always practiced a lot. When I came back, I got very frustrated. I said that, oh, I don't have the supporting container and I just see what I have. So my question is, you know, as a teacher, how you can encourage students like me to already have enough to practice? Fine. I wouldn't want to interfere with the very thing that you need to see. So to try to convince you to feel other than you feel. I, I mean, I could say it, so Kazan could say, it. yeah, you're, you're doing it, just keep going. But to just consider that, again, the instruction is to be with what is showing up. So the disappointment or the standard that you set up when I was in retreat, I was doing all this and now I can't do this anymore. And, and there's some idea that I need to get back to this or that. 
And I would say the, the very disappointment is your invitation. The very disappointment is precisely what you are, you have the opportunity to receive. Uh, it's not, it's not as satisfying as other paths. Um, coming back to this idea of classical Buddhism, there's a lot more antidotes. It's like, here's the problem, here's the antidote, here's the problem, here's the antidote. And, and I would say even the public teaching here is very advanced. It's very direct. It's, I think it's accessible, but to just be encouraged to not get rid of the things that are showing up in consciousness, this is, it's very difficult. Thank you, Bowie. My second question is, what is like, what does it like to practice exertion just as a vow? Especially you receive the vows. Is that exertion? Do that just as to obey the vow, observe the vows? It, to me, the vow really takes on a power of its own. And I don't mean that in like a hyper metaphysical, magical sense, but there is something about taking that vow that's pretty uh, important for a lot of us or pretty heavy for a lot of us. But it's not, it's also not something to be maintained. So I think the exertion on the path, as Soka I was saying, is, is the stillness that we return to. We're not going to radically become a different person. I think the disappointing thing is we think if I change my job or if I change my partner, if I change where I live, then I can be the me I want to be or the me I'm meant to be or the most highest potential of me. Um, and so our exertion in this path is more about willingness to hold our seat in the midst of all those demands to be different, to do something different, to produce on a greater level. Um, Occasionally, you do get some direct feedback like you did tonight. So, because I said, sit a little more, try to sit more. It's disappointing to have to uh, sit more, realizing it's not going to necessarily, you're not going to like blossom from a cocoon and be this beautiful butterfly. You just have to be this like cabbage worm the rest of your life. <laughs> also, another reason I was, um, asking the question today, Chisho shares his ideas of uh, obedience. I'm not bringing that topic, but what he said is very <laughs> inspiring. You know, just sit. And uh, I'm thinking just sit, just like the vow. You're like, for me, the marriage, no matter how dislike my, pa uh, my parent, my husband, it just the vow carries on. But just like, you know, I'm thinking, just sit, just as the vow says. I don't know. I just feel like what he said is very inspiring. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> be kind to yourself, Yu Hong. Don't, you don't need to be Chisho. Like, Chisho has an incredible aptitude for precision and form and consistency, like almost unlike anyone I've ever met. That never needs to translate. It's it's wonderful to have him and that kind of steadiness in practice in the Sangha. What we fall into, though, is when we start to evaluate one another and hold that style up above the rest. And we should appreciate it as his style, as his understanding. And if you draw inspiration, that's also wonderful. But, you know, be kind to yourself. Be kind that you, you never have to be like that. You may never be able to sit every single sitting period for, for years at a time, that is not uh, an obstacle to your awareness. And for some of us, not all of us, but for some of us, if we were able to force ourselves to do that, it actually could inhibit our awareness because we just use a sort of force to lock down so we don't actually have to look at anything. We just obey. And I'm, I'm not at all saying that's what's happening to Chisho, not, not even a little bit. But for those of us, that's not so natural to force it too heavily upon ourselves um, covers up. And so sometimes that vacillation between sitting a lot and we feel ourselves tapering and we sit a lot and we find inspiration, the inspiration seems to dry up a little bit. There's so much richness in that contrast that would be lost if we pursued our path as a way of just locking down and maintaining. 
not to say we don't put some tension on that, that we don't find a way to schedule a little bit more sitting. But the awareness is far more important than, than the accomplishment of perfect forms or the perfect student. Thank you, Pauline. Yes, Mozuku. Mozuku Pauline. The temptation to evaluate <clears throat> ourselves and others on the path is that are we covering up something that we could see, or is it not? What is the caution against that, or is there one? The, there is no caution against it. It's just the awareness of it. Because if we caution against it, then again, you you rip out the very thing that's showing up and you look for something else. It's very natural. A lot of us just tend to evaluate ourselves. We're very heavy handed with ourselves or because of our own fear and insecurity. We want those around us to be doing the same things as us. I think I find that to be the case quite a bit is that the way in which we evaluate others is because we we are afraid that we're doing it incorrectly. So we want them to do it the way we do it. All we need to do is be aware of that and endeavor not to fuel that story too much by acting out of it, speaking out of it, to have a willingness to have that disease that arises when there's such a diversity of ways of approaching the path in the community. So I would like to close for tonight before we do, tomorrow is our monk training day. And I believe there'll be nine monk talks tomorrow. And the monks have been asked to talk about the classical poem Sandokai or the equality of sameness and difference by Sekitokisen or Shito, who was a very early Tang dynasty Zen master who our lineage um, finds its roots in. So that should be really interesting tomorrow if you're able to join us at 10 a.m. And again at 2.30 p.m. So thank you for being here. We'll stand and dedicate the merit. May the merit of this penetrate into all places so that we can have the existing being together in our lives. The Buddha is saying, She be your own son, she be she she be some of the the directions the three times all the heavens, all the heavens, ones, Bodhita, Hoods, Mahasan, Hoods, the great Rajna, Paramita. O Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Ten Directions and the Three Times, please hear us. Please come down out of the light and protect Soku Koji Buddhist Monastery, our Sangha, families, friends, and visitors. Heal everyone who is unhappy, sick, or suffering and fill them with light. 